Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 33, verses 1 through 11. Now Jacob looked up, and he saw Esau coming, and 400 men with him. So he divided the children among Leah and Rachel and the two maids. He put the maids with their children in front, then Leah with her children, and Rachel and Joseph last of all. He himself went ahead of them, bowing himself to the ground seven times, until he came near his brother. But Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. When Esau looked up and saw the women and children, he said, Who are these with you? Jacob said, The children whom God has graciously given your servant. Then the maids drew near, they and their children, and bowed down. Leah likewise and her children drew near and bowed down, and finally Joseph and Rachel drew near, and they bowed down. Esau said, what do you mean by all this company that I meet? Jacob answered, to find favor with my Lord. But Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. Jacob said, no, please. If I find favor with you, then accept my present from my hand. For truly to see your face is like seeing the face of God. Please accept my gift that I have brought, because God has dealt graciously with me, and because I have everything I want. So he urged him, and he took it. The word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. If you love good stories, you have to love this whole Esau-Jacob narrative. Two brothers that are as different as midnight and midday. Esau, older brother, simple, uncomplicated. Uh, He was comfortable in the field or in the woods. He was adept at the sling and the bow. His idea of a long-range plan was what he was going to have for supper. Jacob, oh, uh, he always had a plan. Um... And he was cool, cool as the backside of a pillow, cunning, con man extraordinary. The the name Jacob in Hebrew means conniver. And if anyone ever lived up or down to her name, Jacob did. Twice he got his brother Esau. Remember the first time Esau comes in from a long day of rabbit hunting and he's as hungry as a wolverine and uh, Jacob's over there in the corner and he's been cooking up this batch of homemade chili all day and he lets a little bit of the aroma waft over to his brother and he says, it's yours, it's mine, it's yours for your birthright. Don't do it, Esau, birthright. Connected to that in that day was livestock and land. But that looked pretty pale and, well, intangible over against the fragrance of some homemade cooking. So just like that, birthright gone. Then the blessing. Remember that day Jacob slipped into Father Isaac's tent. Isaac didn't see very well. And and Jacob goes in there and he's disguised himself as Esau all the way down to the hairy arms. And he gets the blessing meant for Esau. What's the big deal? Blessing. I mean, we give blessings all the time. Bless you, bless that, bless this. No, 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 not in that day. Blessing wasn't some little pious sentimentality. It carried, they believe, the very vitality and energy of the one giving the blessing. And once it had been given, it could not be returned. Well, word gets to Esau what's happened. And so he's running around the camp with a ball-peen hammer looking to crush his brother. What he doesn't know is that Jacob has taken the first camel train and headed north. He headed north, and his next victim was his father-in-law Laban. You remember? I mean, Jacob conned him out of his two daughters, his livestock, the kitchen sink, and everything else that wasn't nailed down. So here's Jacob now. He's on the lamb. He's on the loose. Years roll on, decades. And you get the sense from the Scripture that something inside Jacob changed. He grew up. 
He's ready to make amends. He's ready to come home. He gets all the way to the river Jabbok. And remember there he wrestled with God till the break of day. But he's got one more confrontation left. Big, bad brother Esau. You say, wait, wait a minute, that was years ago. Oh, come on, you know the way it is with bitterness. We have a way as humans, bitterness. We, we hang on to it. Um, we let it grow. We know Jacob's changed, but what about Esau? So you all can see in this story, it's almost like Jacob's return to some of his old ways, a little bit of his cunning, conning ways. He's going to just try to grease the skids of his return, soften up his old brother. So he sends herds of donkeys and sheep and, and cattle across the river, you know, like guilt offerings. And he loads his cart with every gift and bauble he can find and rolls them over. And then he sends out his family, all of them, the whole entourage. But finally, no more delay, no more detour, detours. Jacob's got to cross the river. Can you imagine, can you feel the tension that's hanging in the air? What's going to happen? Esau has no interest in the gifts. He's not interested in the herds of donkeys. He doesn't care about all of Jacob's bowing and scraping. We're told Jacob came across and bowed seven times in front of his brother. He's not interested in that. This is what he wants. He wants Jacob. Uh Uh-oh. Surprise of surprise. Not to throttle him, but to embrace him. You ever had a moment like that? You know what you got coming to you. You know what you deserve. And you get something else altogether different. It's called grace. It's called mercy. And, 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 and Jacob is so moved by the whiskers and the warmth of his welcome. Listen. Listen to what he says. He said, and seeing how you have received me. He says, in seeing your face. It is as though I have seen the face of God. For just a moment. It it happens to someone. For just a moment. The unseen presence, the invisible one, becomes real, becomes visible. Oh, we don't see it all the time. A lot of times we walk around like the psalmist. We say, verily, verily, you are a God who hides oneself. But there are those moments there where we see an intimation, a glimmer, a hint of the very face of God. I know some of you would say that. I mean, you would say here and there, and you've seen the intimations of the face of God and the face of creation. Yes, you would say. I'd say I've seen it when I stood before the murmuring sea or the uh, purity of the dawn or the oak and the maple draped in yellow and orange or the pumpkin asleep amidst the sentinel stocks of grain. You say, yes, I saw it. I took a second look and there it was in the bottom right hand corner. It was, it was the signature of the creator. I saw it. I think some of you here would join in Jacob's litany. You would say there have been moments when you have looked at the people before you, around you, across the table from you, and you said there for a moment. I saw the eternal shine through human eyes. I heard divine grace whispered to me in human tones. And you said, brother, sister, parent, child, stranger, friend, in seeing you, I've seen something more, someone more. I I think we miss it. I think one reason we miss those moments is the way we arrange the world. You know how we do it as humans. We... We set up this two-storied universe. God up here, we're down here. Well, that kind of leaves God distant and remote. But we love to put things in piles. We like to make distinctions. We like to separate spirit from flesh and church from world. The God of Scripture just doesn't make those distinctions. Scripture suggests we live in a one-storied universe in which the presence of God stretches from one corner all the way to the other. And as Barbara Brown Taylor said, you can hardly go anywhere without risking bumping your shins on another altar. And this morning story says one of those altars just may be the people around you. 
That shouldn't surprise us. I mean, those of us that are here today, we're, we're sold on incarnation. A God who showed us that flesh and blood and dirt and dust and earth and sky and death are good enough for God. Flesh and blood, Jesus. So transparent. So free from the selfish grasp of self. That, um, people looked at him and said, there, there it is, a window to God. And you say, oh, that's just one person, one moment in time. But didn't he come to show us that all that we're not all that he was? We do have the capacity to let the word made flesh activate our flesh. All that was in him. That life of helping, serving, healing. We have that in us. Esau had it in him. There's a lot of things I don't know about Esau. There's a lot of gaps we have to We know that he was fairly successful. He had a large, if undistinguished family. He had a, a good series of orchards and herds. And we are told in Scripture he, he died in peace. I don't know some of the things he got right and some of the things he got wrong. I do know one day there on the, the south side of the river Jabbok, he wrapped up enough mercy and grace in his life that his brother could say God was made visible, real. I hope this says something to us this morning. I think one thing that pulls us to a place like this is that we're, we're people who seek for God to be more knowable, reachable, available, believable. And if that's your quest, this story should suggest here's a place to start. Believing that another human being can be a window to the divine. I was 16, 17 years old. I think at that point you would have had to describe me as a congenital believer. I'd never been apart from belief, never been apart from the church. When I was 16, 17, I, I wanted to have a faith that was my own. And look, I was a child of the Enlightenment. I mean, I, I, I wanted to have a little more verifiable kind of proof of the existence of God. And so my search took me to my father's library. My father had a magnificent religious spiritual library. There was a book I found there on the philosophy of religion. I think it was the second or third chapter. I, I read about the seven classical proofs for the existence of God. Oh, maybe this is it. But even as a 17-year-old, I could see the arguments were not watertight. And the language was so stilted that, well, the wood was wet for me. It didn't warm the cockles of my soul. My reading took me farther down the line. I read some Christian apologists like C.S. Lewis, and they were helpful, inspiring. But I still wanted something more. I don't think I found the answer as much as it found me. It wasn't in the library. It was in the realm of the relationships around me. There was this football coach, from my parents, and there was something about their faith. It was so winsome, so real. I said, yes. Yeah, that's, I can believe in that. I can start there. There was a retired Methodist minister, Dr. P.M. Boyd. He used to call me sometimes on a Saturday morning and say, Robert, come and we'll take communion. I need you to help me to go to some of the shut-ins in the old Springfield section of Jacksonville. And we would go into these uh, just lonely, dark little rooms. And I still have some of these pictures in my mind. I, I remember going into these rooms. The atmosphere was partly cloudy to cloudy and Dr. Boyd would walk in there, and within a few moments, the air was just bent with brightness. I, I can remember how he would pull a chair up right in front of these elderly persons, and he would lean forward to, to, to carefully hear every moan, every groan, every utterance. I can still see how he took the communion bread, and he broke it with his bare hands, and he did it in a way I just said, this man believes this really is the bread of life. There was something about the way he carried his life, his hope, his faith that started carrying me, that emboldened my belief. Yeah, I could join in Jacob's litany 
And seeing his face, I was beginning to see the face of God. Now turn that around. It's not just other people helping us to know and see God, but think that could happen through us. We could be that window. Every week we come here and we talk about wonderful realities that we believe in. Faith, hope, love. But look, there's a lot of people out there. But those words are just vague abstractions. They float about three feet off the ground. But then someone like you comes around. You're not perfect, but you wrap a little bit of that up in your life. You, you enflesh it. And for a moment, someone might say, yeah, now I see it. And they may even see the author behind those words. Look, there's a world out there that's waiting. It's a discriminating, sometimes skeptical world. It's a world that's tired of the come-ons and the glitz and the super signs and the super success stories. They're not looking for something superficial. They're looking for somebody to make it real. Okay. About 15, 20 years ago, you might have remembered this, a town in North Alabama, everybody got real excited. This man was coming home from work about 5.30 in the afternoon, and there's a big oak tree in the town square, and Kudzu had grown up through it, and he's there at the stoplight, and it's at sundown, and the light coming through that has created this silhouette that for him looked, for all the world, like the silhouette of Jesus. And he told some other people, and they came and said, yeah, yeah, we see it too. And everybody got real excited, got on the evening news, made the national news. Then they had a bunch of televangelists come to town, and they started looking at that and predicting the second coming. And people were excited for about two weeks. For about two weeks. I remember hearing that thinking it's kind of sad. I don't think there's a world out there that needs to see some shadows. Needs to see the silhouette of Jesus at sundown. I think there's a world out there that needs to see some flesh and blood people like you and me who bear a family resemblance to God in the daytime. Okay? Look. You have it in you. I have it in me. We don't get it right all the time. But when we do, there's no telling what somebody might see. You've heard me tell a lot of Fred Craddock stories. Some of you don't know that his father, for, for most of his life, was an agnostic. His father had, had, had grown up under bitter circumstances, had to raise a family through the Depression, and he had some anger toward the church, anger toward God. Craddock said, we would come home from Sunday church. I'd come home with my mother. My father would be sitting there in the porch just railing. Oh, we're going to have another late lunch because you guys had to go to church. And they don't care about you. You're just another pledge. You're another dollar. God doesn't care about you. And then every time a new minister would come to their town, their little church, well, the people would say, you need to go out there and talk to old man Craddock. He's a hard head about God. Kind of win him over. And, and Mrs. Craddock just hated those moments because here comes this new preacher. And she knew within a few moments her husband would be cussing him out like a Philistine and just railing, you don't care about me, just another pledge, another dollar. God doesn't care about me. Fred Craddock said, there was one time his father did not say that. Memphis Hospital, throat cancer for his father. Most of his voice box larynx had to be removed. There had been months of radiation that had burned his neck. They had to put a little stoma tube in so his father could breathe. Couldn't swallow food, couldn't talk. But Fred's mother had called him and said, some good things are happening in the middle of all this. It's been our church. They've just surrounded us with this unbelievable care. Um, they've showed up with food. They um, have been here to um, sit with your father. He even let them sit with them because, so I could go home and get some rest. And they've been encouraging. They've been here through it all. And so Craddock now himself, Fred Craddock goes to Memphis, the hospital, to see his father in his last days. And when he walks in, there are cards 
all over the walls that had been taped to the walls and words of prayers, words of encouragement, scriptures. And Craddock goes over and looks at them and almost every one of those cards was one from one of those people, families that he remembered in that little church he'd grown up in. And his father sees him looking at the cards and motions to him to come over and he points at a Kleenex box. And Fred thinks his father wants some Kleenex, but his father takes the box and flips it over. And then he points looking for a fountain pen and Craddock hands him a pen and his father writes these words on the back of the Kleenex box. It's a quote from Shakespeare. In this harsh world, draw your breath with pain to tell my story. In this harsh world, draw your breath with pain to tell my story. And Craddock said to his father, what do you want me to tell them? His father gets to pen and he writes, tell them I was wrong. Tell them I was wrong. Do you see what's happened? A man who saw God as distant, remote, or not at all, has seen some persons like you and me wrap up grace and truth in their lives, and he could join with Jacob of old and saying, and seeing your faces, it is as though I have seen the face of God. Let us pray. Oh God, perhaps we miss you the most, not because you are remote, but because you are so near. You show up in all the corners and crevices of creation. You show up in the people among us, across the table from us. Give us eyes to see so that you may surprise us with um, how very present you are and how very real you are. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.